I first came to an ISKCON temple on Labor Day weekend, 1967, in Montreal. I was studying in Toronto, and I'd come for the weekend to visit Expo. And I casually asked one of my friends, is there any Hindu, any Hindu temple in Montreal? He said, yes, the Americans have opened some temple here. Why don't you visit it? So I went to the Montreal temple on Labor Day weekend, 67. And I took part in the Sunday program. The kids then just went on and on and on and on. And as, and as I was leaving the temple, they had a visitor's book in which I wrote down my name and address. And after returning to Toronto, I started getting a letter every month informing me about the schedule and asking for donations. And in May 68, I received a letter. Our Swamiji is coming to Montreal on June 4, 68. Please come and meet him. So I was planning on relocating back to Montreal in any case. And uh, I, I arrived in Montreal on May 31st. And the first assignment the temple president gave me was to clean Prabhupada's apartment because Prabhupada was coming the next day and Prabhupada resided at 420 Prince Arthur. So I had the privilege of meeting Prabhupada on June 1st, 1968. And I had almost no exposure to sadhus in India. In fact, there was one Bengali gentleman, Mr. Mukherjee. We used to come to meet Prabhupada regularly. We told me, oh, the sadhu is different. Anyway, as time went along, I could see that Prabhupada was a genuine saint. He quoted from the scriptures. He never said something of his own. He was very, he was like a real well wisher, very friendly. And he wanted everyone to be happy. But he knew that real happiness would only come if we follow the scriptures. And Prabhupada was always straightforward. And in those days, there were not so many devotees. Prabhupada actually stayed in Montreal for three months. He had some green card problems in, in America. So he had to go out of America. And he came to Montreal on June 1st, and he stayed on till August 68. And in those days, leaders from different parts of America would regularly come to meet Prabhupada. As I said, I had zero exposure to sadhus. I had never been to Vrindavan in my life. I had never even heard of Vrindavan or Mahapur before I met Prabhupada. And I had never heard of Lord Chaitanya. The brief introduction about Prabhupada was given to me by the Bengali gentleman who said, I've touched the feet of many sadhus, but he looks special. And as I said earlier, Prabhupada also gave me a lot of attention. I was Prabhupada's first Indian disciple in the West. And Prabhupada had a strong desire to also preach to the Indians. And he wanted them to take to Krishna consciousness. Actually, there was one Indian who had joined from Buffalo, but he didn't stay for long. In June 68, we had gone to a high school engagement in a Christian school. It was a school for girls, and there were many nuns in the school. And this program was arranged by a French-Canadian devotee called Janathan Prabhu. He was doing his PhD at that time. 
So Prabhupada gave the lecture, and as usual, after Prabhupada's lecture, he would say, any questions? The same Mr. Mukherjee, who had told me that Prabhupada was a different type of saint, got up from his chair and started attacking Prabhupada. He started saying, why do you have to come and preach this philosophy in these Christian countries? They have their own philosophy. You don't need to do this. The devotees were very upset in the way he was being attacked. He probably was not being criticized by the Christian nun. He was being criticized by one of the people who came in his entourage. So the devotees were very upset, and Prabhupada was very cool. In August, Prabhupada was leaving Montreal to go to America. And he told me, Gopal, go and call that Mr. Mukherjee. I said, Prabhupada, he insulted you so badly. Why do you want to see him? And Prabhupada said, I must have done something to him in my last life for which he took revenge. So Prabhupada, so I called this gentleman and Prabhupada blessed him before leaving. So from this we can see how magnanimous and merciful Prabhupada was. And even though this man had humiliated Prabhupada, he really attacked Prabhupada very badly. Prabhupada tolerated it, did not utter one word. And in fact, he blessed him before leaving. So I think from this example, we should draw inspiration and not retaliate the moment somebody criticizes us. We have to learn to practice in other person jena. When Prabhupada was in Montreal, he opened a bank account in the Canadian Imperial Bank of Commerce and the branch, I believe, was on Sherbrooke Street. And Prabhupada told me to handle that account for him. So I was giving Prabhupada regular reports, and Prabhupada saw <laughs> that the bank was charging a high fee for some reason. And Prabhupada was so concerned about saving every penny of Krishna's money, he said, tell the bank not to charge this fee. <laughs> And Prabhupada, I think, they had not closed the bank account when the bank was charging a high fee. As we know from numerous examples, Prabhupada's concern was not to waste even a penny of Krishna's money. He viewed everything as Krishna's property. And whenever he saw some misuse, he would take steps to stop it. As Prabhupada was in Montreal, uh, many leaders would come there, and Montreal had become a focal point. In fact, Prabhupada saw some buildings in Montreal and said, this could be our world headquarters. He was at one time planning on making the world headquarters in Montreal. I mean, Prabhupada saw everything as a possible Prabhupada always was thinking how he can use everything in service of the Lord. There was one lady who came to meet Prabhupada and Prabhupada as usual preached to her, preached chant Hare Krishna Mantra. The lady said, Swamiji, I'm always chanting, 24 hours. Prabhupada said, 24 hours? How do you chant? She said, I'm mentally chanting 24 hours. So Prabhupada said, when you're hungry, do you mentally eat or do you physically eat? She said, physically. Prabhupada said, no, you should start eating mentally. So she realized, and Prabhupada told her, if you want to chant the Holy Name, you should chant it and hear, not just mentally go on chanting. That is as good as no chanting. So this lady was convinced that what Prabhupada said was right. So Prabhupada emphasized that we chant the holy name and hear the holy name. And as the scriptures say, the more intent we are in chanting, 
the greater will be the effect and the faster will be the cleansing of the heart. Prabhupada came to India with his Western disciples, I believe in 1971 or something. Anyway, they created a big stir. Prabhupada held festivals in major cities of India. And these festivals were attended by over 30,000 people. So taking advantage of the popularity of the Hare Krishna movement, one leading movie star in India made a movie called Hare Rama, Hare Krishna. The movie was a big hit in India. It was a super hit. The positive, the positive thing in the movie was the Hare Krishna mantra was being played in the background in the whole movie. And they had a song which said, which had the Hare Krishna mantra. But the weak point in the movie was it showed that devotees take drugs, then they feel high, and then they chant Hare Krishna. So this movie was released in India in 1973. So that time I was residing in America, but I had just come to India for a holiday. So I met Prabhupada in Akash Ganga, and I told him, Shri Prabhupada, this movie is going to give our movement a bad name. Our movement was brand new in India at that time. And I said, this movie is showing that we chant Hare Krishna, and people take drugs, so that will spoil our image. Prabhupada was totally understood. He said, nothing will be lost. People will hear the Hare Krishna mantra and get purified. Don't worry. And very interestingly, about three years ago, I initiated a devotee in America and I asked him, how did he join the movement? So he told me when he was a young kid, there was a movie release called Hare Rama, Hare Krishna. And he heard the Hare Krishna mantra in that movie. And after that, he fell in love with this mantra. And he would go everywhere where he could hear this song that was a big hit. But that movie planted a seed of Krishna consciousness in his heart. And 25 years later, or 35 years later, he got initiated. So what Prabhupada said was right. People will hear the holy name and benefit. Prabhupada's always right. We should know that. But before I came, there was almost no book production in India. And Prabhupada told me to start the book production. And Prabhupada was very keen that we publish a lot of books. At that time, we were just beginning to publish books. So, in 1976, I believe 77, I had arranged a very big book display of Prabhupada's books in a very big book house called International Book House. This was a very big book house, and they were distributing Time and Reader's Digest. And the owner was a life member, and I was cultivating him. So I arranged a very big display in his store. We had Prava books on display with all the promotion material. And we ran this promotion for one month. But after one month, not many books were sold. So I went to Prabhupada to give him a report that even though we had a very heavy promotion, prominent display in the, in the windows, etc., we didn't sell a lot of books. And Prabhupada said, my books are sold because of the enthusiasm of my disciples. And in a store, Nobody's enthusiastic. That's why. So we have seen that when devotees are enthusiastic, 
they achieve outstanding results. Doesn't matter what the service is, especially book distribution. And if you're not enthusiastic, if we do something half-heartedly, then the results are not the same. So Prabhupada repeated that twice or thrice. My books are sold because of the enthusiasm of my devotees. So I usually try and tell this story to some good devotees. And they all testify that when they're enthusiastic, they achieve very good results. So I went there in 76. We took Prabhupada's books. We showed them to scholars in Moscow and Leningrad. At that time, St. Petersburg was called Leningrad. And they appreciated the books. And then we went there again in 77. When I went there in 77, the late Pithu Putra Maharaj was there also in Bugarba. So we took part in the book fair. It was a very big book fair. And in the, in the end, we got a certificate from the Soviet government appreciating proper books for bringing world peace. So I received a certificate in Bombay around September 77. I took it to Prabhupada, who was in Vrindavan. His health wasn't so good. Prabhupada was so happy with that certificate that Soviet government has recognized Prabhupada's books as contributing to world peace. And Prabhupada showed that certificate to everyone who came. His godbrothers would come, he would say, this is the recognition we got from Soviet Union. Unfortunately, we've lost that certificate somewhere. I feel really sorry. But uh, Prabhupada very much appreciated that the Soviet government was appreciating our books. One of the big problems in those days was visas for Indian, for Americans. At that time, we virtually had no Indian devotees. Some were beginning to join. And 99% of our devotees were American. And they were all having visa problems. Constantly, they had to go out of the country and come back. So this was a great source of anxiety to Prabhupada. And he personally met and deputed me to meet people to try and get the Indian government to give us some concession. So I went and saw the Home Minister, the, the Foreign Minister of India at that time, who was Mr. Vajpayee. And I went to Vajpayee with a plea that some concession be given to his con devotees. And when I came back to Vrindavan that evening and gave Prabhupada the report of the meeting, Prabhupada said, one day this man will become more important. He'll hold a very important position. And a few years later, he became the Prime Minister of India. Prabhupada was very concerned that we don't give away free books. We had a program in the Home Minister of India's house. Prabhupada first came and gave the lecture. And after the lecture, I gave the Home Minister Secretary many books, more than I should have. So some devotee told Prabhupada that I gave about 10, 12 books free. And I said, Prabhupada was very, very upset. He said, you shouldn't give away these books like this. We should be very careful. In other words, Prabhupada didn't want us to freely give out books. I mean, he wanted these books to be respected. Sometimes when you get free, people don't value it so much. So I learned my lesson at that time. And I've been telling devotees, we should be very cautious how we give these free books. One day at one o'clock in the night, 
Prabhupada called for me. Prabhupada would often call for his secretaries and GBCs, even in the middle of the night. Ms. Prabhupada would be busy serving Krishna 24 hours. It's not that he went to sleep. He would get up at 10.30 in the night and start his translation work. So Prabhupada had written an ad. The ad was said in brief, open invitation from ISKCON to all of India. And the invitation was, Prabhupada said India is a poor country. I will feed everyone. So he wrote an ad on a paper with his own handwriting. Open invitation, come and live with us, like us. And Prabhupada said, go tomorrow to all the newspapers, tell them to put this in the papers, and put billboards that Eskon is inviting everyone to come and live with us, like us. So I asked Prabhupada, we don't have the means to do that. We are we going to feed everyone and accommodate everyone? And Prabhupada said, come and live with us, like us. Like us means they have to follow our principles, chant Hare Krishna. And if they're ready to do that, then I will maintain all of them. Not that they could do their nonsense and we would maintain. So Prabhupada was very intelligent. He said, open invitation, come and live with us, like us. We were getting ready for the Kumbh Mela in, I think it was 77 or 76, where it was a big Kumbh Mela. And we were thinking of publishing cheap books for mass distribution. So I think we published a small book. But many people were suggesting we print the Bhagavad Gita like Gita Press has without any purpose. And they said, we said, lax. So I thought it was a good idea. And being the BBD manager, I went to Prabhupada and said, everyone is saying, we can print the Gita like Gita Press, without purpose, and we'll just relax. Prabhupada said, no, you can't print any book without purpose. And he said, this is not acceptable. So the point is, Prabhupada's purpose makes us understand the books better. And without proper purpose, we are free to make our own interpretation. And Prabhupada was very keen that people understand this knowledge as it is. So I've told this to maybe managers all over the world. So before the Prabhupada's departure in Bombay, I was discussing with Prabhupada how I'm going to manage the Bombay Temple. And Prabhupada said, make a council and have decisions made in the council. And Prabhupada said, there's a Bengali saying that if you make a decision in a group and something goes wrong, you can always say, I didn't make it alone. Everybody was a party to the decision. And if you do it on your own, and something goes wrong, you take the blame. So Prabhupada wanted a small council to involve in decision making. Prabhupada was very particular about uh, cleanliness. So one day he was sitting in the front room and he just asked me, how is everything? And I said, okay. And then he looked up at the nest, looked up at the ceiling. And then he saw there was a nest in that small room and a bird or two inside. He said, you see everything's okay? This is okay? 
Look at this dirt. Prabhupada had very, very sharp eyes. As some of you may know, Prabhupada would uh, be translating books in the night. So one day he got up and he saw that the watchman wasn't there. The watchman at the front gate, uh, at the gate in front of the guest house, wasn't there. So Prabhupada was very concerned. So he thought of a good plan. He told the watchman, every hour equal to the time, you have to ring the bell. And Prabhupada's logic was, if uh, the watchman has to ring the bell every hour, every hour, he won't go to sleep. So that was the background that led to the introduction of the watchman ringing the bell every hour. Prabhupada was an expert manager. He knew how to solve all problems. To attract donations, we have to give the donor some tax benefit. And we were having trouble in maintaining our tax exempt status. So many professional lawyers and child accountants suggested, why don't you set up a research institute? And if you set up a research institute, the government will give you 100% tax exemption. So we came up with a plan that we'll call, uh, we'll have a research institute called Vedic Research Institute. So when the proponent said, this plan could attract a lot of donations and then we can establish a Vedic Research Institute. And Prabhupada said, why Vedic Research Institute? Vyasadev has done all the research. We don't need to do any further research. And there's no need of Vedic Research Institute. So Prabhupada was not interested that it will attract more donations. Prabhupada wanted to preserve the purity and he was concerned that under the banner of Vedic research, we may speculate, whereas he has given us the real philosophy in his purpose to the books that he published. Prabhupada was in his room doing his japa when some guests came in and they started knocking at the door saying they want to see Prabhupada. The secretary said Prabhupada is taking a rest. But Prabhupada overheard some people want to see him. And they were disappointed that they couldn't see him. So Prabhupada was so concerned that he told his secretary, let them come in, open the door. And Prabhupada sat for two, three hours and preached to the guests. So but this just shows how Prabhupada was always concerned about preaching. And, and even when he wasn't physically well, he did not stop his preaching. And as we know in Vrindavan, even in his last few months on the planet, when he wasn't physically well, he did not stop his translation work. He would go on with his translation. He had Padamna read the Sanskrit. He had somebody holding, helping him sit down. He was virtually whispering the purports. But he did that because he wanted to save humanity. He wanted to leave behind the scriptures that could save humanity. So we should also cultivate a similar mood. As far as I can see, Prabhupada was a Vaikuntha man. Once Prabhupada was asked to speak about his spiritual master, and Prabhupada said, what can I speak of the Vaikuntha man? So Prabhupada was also a Vaikuntha man. In my opinion, he possessed all the 26 qualities. 
And Chaitanya Mahaprabhu had predicted that the holy name will be chanted in every town and village of the world. And I have no doubt that Prabhupada appeared to fulfill this realization, this prediction of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. So Prabhupada was an empowered preacher, yeah, one great Acharya, one great Vaishnava said he was a Shakta Vaishavatar, but he was an empowered preacher who was sent by Lord Chaitanya to take the holy name to every corner of the globe. And today we see that Prabhupada's glory is increasing even faster. You can go to any corner of the globe, people have heard of Prabhupada. In fact, many people come to the temple and say, when is Swamiji going to speak? In fact, many people write and say, where's the author of these books? And Prabhupada's fame is all over the world. And as we preach and spread the movement, his fame will increase more and more. We have to understand that everything we need to know is there in Prabhupada's books. Have faith in the books. Have faith in Prabhupada's instructions. Go follow the GBC body. And we'll be able to, we will be able to cross over insurmountable, insurmountable problems. But we need to be determined to follow Prabhupada's path. Now that we say, yes, I'm a Prabhupada Nuga and do my own thing. Prabhupada Nuga means following Prabhupada 100%. Je Anilo Prema Dana Koruna Prachur